Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Sakshi Dua for a talk on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Dr. Dua is a dual board certified physician in pulmonary disease and critical care medicine. After completing her residency in home medicine at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, she trained as a pulmonary critical care counseling fellow at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. She joined Mount Sinai Hospital as a transplant physician in 2008 with a clinical interest in interstitial lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. She has served as co-PI in many clinical trials in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis at Mount Sinai Hospital. Her interests also include medical education and global health. She serves as the program director for the Fellowship Training Program in Pulmonary Disease and Critical Care Medicine, and also serves as the director for the Fellows Ambulatory Care Pulmonary Clinic. She also volunteers as faculty to train physicians in pulmonary disease and critical care medicine at Black Lion Hospital in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She also volunteers as a physician for the Human Rights Clinic at Mount Sinai. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sakshi Dua. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me on this post-long weekend grand rounds on a cold winter morning. For the purpose, first of all, I have no disclosures. For the purpose of this topic, I decided to distribute this talk in five segments. We're going to talk about the definition and diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. Talk about epidemiology and pathogenesis, clinical course and prognostic factors, treatment, and then we'll talk about the new FDA-approved therapies that are very exciting in this field. So starting with a case that presented to our Respiratory Institute ILD program last week, it's a 65-year-old male, ex-smoker, otherwise healthy, who presented with slowly progressive dyspnea on exertion for two years, associated with a dry cough that was very persistent despite treatment with multiple courses of steroids for what was presumed to be asthma and with antibiotics for what was presumed to be bronchitis. The patient had Velcro-like rails on examination, and no, this was not congestive heart failure. Patient did not have any JVD or lower extremity edema. Heart sounds were normal. And PFTs that we obtained in the office showed no obstruction, but showed moderate restriction and a reduced gas transfer as measured by diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. The patient was also desaturating with walking on room air down to 88%. We obtained a chest x-ray given these findings, and as you can see, this was highly abnormal, showing increased interstitial markings in both the lung fields with reticular infiltrates bilaterally. Now, since we're so efficient at the Respiratory Institute, we were immediately able to get a CT scan right away to confirm these abnormal findings. And as you can see, this CT scan is very abnormal, and you don't have to be a radiologist to notice that. These lungs have fibrocystic changes in a pattern of distribution that involves the periphery of the lungs with some central sparing. And I'll come back to this pattern because this is quite important to remember. So we are at a junction here where if you see a patient like that in the office, the crossroads are, what do you do next? The first option is you call your favorite pulmonologist, which for most of you is probably Dr. Padilla. Or you call your favorite radiologist, and you can insert any name there, but the ILD radiologists that we tend to rely on are doctors Salvatore, Jacoby, Mendelssohn, Eber, and Cham, not in that particular order. Or you could call your favorite thoracic surgeon because you need a biopsy of this lung. And as you can see, I ran out of space because there's so many thoracic surgeons I love. Okay, so what pretty much I did is describe the salient clinical features of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a subacute or chronic illness in older males. This demographic is important to remember because every time we see a female who's on the younger side, and by younger I mean anywhere between 50 to 55 years of age, we really should question the diagnosis of IPF and not rely on IPF as a diagnosis. This is an insidious disease, so the onset of dyspnea and cough is very slow and hardly noticeable. Patients mostly ascribe the, these symptoms to getting older and just getting deconditioned. They're often misdiagnosed as congestive heart failure or asthma, and in fact have been on mega doses of diuretics or steroids, et cetera. The patients in advanced stages of disease will have Velcro quality rails. 
There's restriction on pulmonary function tests, so this is a restrictive lung disease, and there's evidence of impaired gas exchange as we measure by PFDs, which is pretty much diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide, and increased A to A gradient on blood gases. So these patients, if you walk them, will desaturate on room air in the advanced stages. Important to know that in the early stages of disease, you may actually have normal pulmonary function tests and may not really have any abnormality detectable just by PFT testing. And so coming back to the outline of my talk, I want to talk about the definition and diagnosis of IPF. So by definition, IPF, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, is a very specific form of chronic progressive fibrosing interstitial pneumonia of unknown cause. This is important to remember, hence the word idiopathic. Occurring primarily in older adults, and yes, there is a male predominance, and limited to the lungs, so this is a single organ abnormality, associated with histopathologic and or radiologic pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia. Now, I realize this is probably the longest sentence in the entire language of English, it is also confusing and has a lot of jargon. So for ease, I dif basically divided this entire definition into its three components. So the diagnostic criteria of IPF will hinge upon finding causes for underlying lung disease. So first of all, exclude known causes of interstitial lung disease, and I'll go over what that could be. Then the presence of a UIP, or usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, on high resolution chest CT scan of the patient when you don't have a surgical lung biopsy, or the presence of usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP pattern on a surgical lung biopsy specimen. So we'll go over each of these one at a time. For known causes, pretty much the three major categories you need to remember for interstitial lung disease are connective tissue diseases, drug exposure, and environmental exposures. In connective tissue diseases, the diseases that are most likely to mimic IPF are either rheumatoid arthritis or scleroderma. And hence, every patient that is being worked up for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis should be evaluated for any occult connective tissue disease that may be hiding in there and presenting itself as pulmonary fibrosis. And hence, you can see we send an extensive panel of connective tissue disease serologies aimed at looking for any evidence of rheumatoid arthritis, as you see here with rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibody, for scleroderma, and hence looking for SCL70 antibodies, for polymyositis and dermatomyositis or anti-synthetase syndromes, and hence there's a huge myositis panel that is sent, which includes JO1 antibody, Sjogren's antibodies, ANA to look for lupus and for other conditions, and then checking muscle enzymes. So really, you can imagine that we work really closely with a rheumatologist to work up a patient for IPF. You don't want to label somebody IPF if indeed they really have a connective tissue disorder with an interstitial lung disease. The other thing to look, at, look for would be drug exposures, and the two notorious ones would be amiodarone and methotrexate, because they can mimic pulmonary fibrosis in the lung that can look like IPF. And the third thing to look for would be environmental exposures, and this could be either domestic or occupational. And so the presence of asbestos exposure or metal dust exposure, such as brass, lead, steel exposure, or growing up in a farm, being exposed to farming animals, or bird breeding, all these exposures will be something you need to rule out with a very good history to make sure that other <coughs> forms of pulmonary fibrosis are not mimicking IPF. Because treatment really matters. It's different in IPF versus other known causes of ILD. So moving on to the next criteria, say we have ruled out any known causes of ILD, and that will be connective tissue disorders, drug exposures, or environmental exposures. The next step would be to look at this high-res CT scan of the patient very carefully for this thing called the UIP pattern. UIP is usual interstitial pneumonia. What is a UIP pattern? UIP pattern will be pretty much the presence of typical findings in the absence of atypical findings. What are the typical findings? Typical findings are the presence of traction bronchiectasis and honeycomb changes on a CT scan.
An absence of atypical findings would be there should be no ground glass opacities, there should be no hazy nodules, and there should be no consolidation because the presence of these findings points towards other etiologies of pulmonary fibrosis and not IPF. Now, not only do these typical findings have to be there, they have to be there in a very specific pattern. The pattern is important because the distribution matters. So the distribution for UIP pattern should be that there is an apical basal gradient. What do I mean by that? I mean that the lower lobes are more involved than the upper lobes, and there's a subpleural gradient. This means the peripheral of the lung is more involved than central areas of the lung. And so I'll give you examples of each of these. The first is traction bronchiectasis. As the name suggests, traction means being pulled apart. Bronchiectasis means abnormal dilation of airways. Put together, these abnormally dilated airways in areas of fibrosis are traction bronchiectasis. And some would argue that this is probably the first radiographic sign of IPF. The second change that we see is called honeycomb changes. Honeycomb, just as the word means, looks like a beehive right here. This is a beehive of fibrosis seen in IPF lungs. Now, what about the distribution? Not only do you need the presence of these typical findings, there has to be a very specific distribution of these. The apical basal gradient that I mentioned means that the lower lobes on a coronal section of a CT scan are much highly involved compared to the upper lobe. And so this gradient pretty much signifies the presence of IPF. The other gradient we look for is subpleural gradient meaning the peripheral of the lung is much more involved than the center of the lung, so it almost feels like the fibrosis is progressing from outward in. And this distribution is very important to know because that's what really clinches the diagnosis of IPF on a CT scan. So moving on to already looked for IPF pattern on CT scan, what if the patient doesn't have it? That's when you would subject the patient to a surgical lung biopsy. Now, needless to say, the kind of CT scan you're ordering for interstitial lung disease will almost always be a high resolution CT scan. And the kind of biopsy that you expect to diagnose interstitial lung disease with would almost always be a surgical lung biopsy because the bronchoscopic or transbronchial biopsy specimens are really not large enough to look for all these changes that we're looking for. So what is a UIP pattern on a surgical lung biopsy? UIP pattern means that you have these four findings. This is a low power field of a surgical lung biopsy specimen. If you look at the distribution of fibrosis, which is these pink areas, you will notice that still the distribution is very subpleural. Here's the pleura. Right beneath the pleura is the massive changes of fibrosis. And as you proceed to the center of the lung, these fibrotic changes diminish. The presence of alternating normal and abnormal lung is very typical for IPF. So UIP, which is the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, is the histologic counterpart of the clinical diagnosis of IPF. You see alternating normal and abnormal lung. This term called tempor temporal heterogeneity means that there are several different ages of scar tissue found in the lung. Temporal means different time. Heterogeneity means there's different varying ages of scarring in the lung. Honeycomb change, the same thing that we saw on a CT scan, you will see architectural distortion of the lung parenchyma looking like a beehive. And then this focus that we call the fibroblast foci, this is what's seen on a high power field. This little focus sitting right underneath the epithelium, which is a collection of myxoid and collagenous tissue with spindle-shaped cells, is really considered to be the leading edge of airway injury in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. These foci are considered to be the active areas of where idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis occurs and proceeds. And in fact, studies have shown that a larger number of fibroblastic foci per high power field correlate with worse prognosis. So actually, the number of these that you see under a high power field does matter because it correlates with worsening prognosis. And so we have this diagnostic pathway that we use at our ILD program at the Respiratory Institute. We have a patient that we suspect of having IPF. We try to find identifiable causes of their interstitial lung disease, and we already established that at least, at the very least, should be connective tissue disorders, drug exposures, and occupational or environmental exposures. 
If we find these identifiable causes, then we know this patient does not have IPF by definition. If we do not find any of these causes, then we look at the CT scan, a high resolution on the patient, very carefully. If we are able to find definite evidence of UIP pattern, and I already told you that should be traction bronchiectasis, honeycomb changes in a very distinct distribution with the bases more involved than the tops of the lung, the subpleura more involved than the center of the lung, then we know the patient has IPF and we can actually stop further workup. We don't need any further testing to determine that. But what if the CT scan does not really show definite UIP findings? What if they are just possible findings with some atypical features or it doesn't even look consistent with UIP? That's when we want to call our favorite thoracic surgeon and get a surgical lung biopsy on this patient if they can tolerate it medically speaking. Now this surgical lung biopsy will either show UIP findings or not show UIP findings. So what if you find something else? You find granulomas, you find lots of interstitial lymphocytic inflammation. When you find all sorts of different changes, that's when you can safely say this patient does not have IPF. However, if you find changes that may or may not be UIP, or probable or possible UIP, that's when you need the multidisciplinary discussion. This pretty much is what is needed at the end of the day when there's any confusion whether the patient has IPF or not, even when a surgical lung biopsy may not be able to tell you completely. That's when this team will tell the patient whether they do or do not have IPF. And so this simple diagnostic pathway really helps us with every patient that we work on. And so I hope that with this diagnostic pathway, I've actually answered your question of what will you do next in that patient that you saw. Of course, you will still be calling your favorite pulmonologist, and hopefully by the end of this talk, that would include my name up there as well, <laughs> along with Dr. Padillas. Of course, the next thing you will do is discuss the case with a radiologist well-versed in ILD, because this radiologist may or may not be able to tell you with confidence if the chest CT findings are typical or not typical for UIP, and as a result, you will know whether the patient may or may not have IPF. Of course, if the findings are not typical for UIP, you will subject the patient to a surgical lung biopsy, and once you've done that, of course, you'll have to call your favorite lung pathologist to ask them what they see on the biopsy specimen. And that for us pretty much is Dr. Beasley. Okay, so in summary, the historical gold standard of histologic diagnosis has been replaced by a dynamic in integrated approach. And that really does include your multidisciplinary discussion. This has now become the standard of care. Every pulmonologist should have a chest radiologist and a pathologist and a thoracic surgeon and a rheumatologist and a GI doctor to consult with for every interstitial lung disease patient. This is what we call the clinical radiologic pathologic method. And so if anybody had any doubt how I feel about my interstitial lung disease program colleagues, this is exactly how I feel. I am that puppy. And oh, thank God I found them, because I don't want to be alone for even five minutes. Every difficult case of ILD requires all my colleagues to weigh in. Moving on to the second part of this talk, epidemiology, how common is IPF, and what are the pathogenic mechanisms? All right, so how common is it? Well, it depends on what kind of case definition you use, whether it's broad or narrow. And so if you were to be a little more inclusive, this study, by Raghu shows that the prevalence of IPF would be anywhere from 42 persons per 100,000 in the population at any given time. If you were to use a narrow case definition, there will be about 14 people per 100,000 in the population. What about incidence? The number of people having new diagnosis of IPF per year would be about 16.3 per 100,000 population. And if you were to use a really narrow definition, that would be about seven people per 100,000 per year. And so the range, as you can see, really does depend on how you would define patients with IPF. And this really means that every single person here in this room will encounter a patient with IPF. While IPF is uncommon, it is not a rare disease. 
So then what are the pathogenic mechanisms? This is a moving target. Things are changing constantly in this field. However, the information that we have now, I'm going to share with you. The pathogenesis of IPF really starts at the level of alveolar epithelial cells, where there is a yet unidentified airway injury or a trigger. And this is why the word idiopathic still stays with this disease. We don't know what that initial trigger is. There is basically cell death with impaired re-epithelialization. There's something about the cells that just don't grow and replace the epithelium because whatever injurious mechanism affects these cells causes basement membrane damage. This causes a release of a lot of growth factors that are all very pro-fibrotic. These growth factors pretty much are transforming growth factor beta, fibroblast growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, and vascular endothelial growth factor. These are all the bad chemokines that are involved in pulmonary fibrosis. These factors tend to form this new form of cell that we call a myofibroblast. This cell is actually a hybrid between a fibroblast and a myocyte and carries the properties of both meaning that like a myocyte, it will have contractile nature, and like a fibroblast, it promotes lung fibrosis. This is a really bad cell to have because this cell is resistant to apoptosis. So you can imagine there's some sort of a parallel between cancerous cell and this cell because this cell has a very advanced cell survival. This cell basically feed, feeds back into the alveolar epithelium and replaces the normal epithelial cells with this abnormal phenotype. This particular phenomenon is called EMT, epithelial mesenchymal transition. The EMT focus is what we see on a lung biopsy specimen as a fibroblast foci meaning that area of abnormality that we saw right underneath the epithelium with a lot of myxoid and collagenous tissue, this is the cell that is replacing the epithelial cells. At the same time, this cell also feeds back into these cytokines and produces more and more of these. These cells produce a lot of collagen, and so there's a lot of matrix remodeling that occurs in the lung with pulmonary fibrosis, which in the presence of vascular remodeling causes that abnormal architectural distortion that we see on a CT scan and a lung biopsy specimen. And this is the honeycomb change that you will see. Now add into this mix some oxidation injury, so reactive oxygen species are also involved. Add into this mix some procoagulation activity because there are a lot of procoagulant factors involved in pulmonary fibrosis and a Th2, Th1 imbalance all of which feed back into this mechanism by producing more fibrotic chemokines. So what are the potential risk factors that we see in IPF in patients? Smoking is supposed to be very highly correlated with the presence of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, especially greater than 20 pack years. In fact, a majority of cases that we see are ex-smokers. Microbial agents, a lot of studies have been done that look for viruses in patients' biopsy specimens, and tons of viruses have been found. This is, again, just an association, not causation. And so there's Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis C virus. In fact, a lot of pre-liver transplant patients that we see with liver cirrhosis who have HCV liver cirrhosis, we find a lot of interstitial lung disease on those patients. Cytomegalovirus and human herpes viruses, all these virus DNA have been found in lung biopsy specimens of IPF patients above and beyond general population. Gastroesophageal reflux, this is a big one. 90% of IPF patients have gastroesophageal reflux, and so not only just acid reflux lead to progression of pulmonary fibrosis, also non-acid or alkaline reflux has been known to be associated. And finally, genetic factors. This is a new developing mechanism of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis seen in about 5% of cases, with the only difference clinically that these are younger patients. So patients who have genetic forms of IPF will be under 50 years of age when first seen. What is familial IPF? Familial IPF can be seen in 5% of IPF patients involving close family members of patients who have IPF. It is an autosomal dominant with variable penetrance kind of genetic. Heterozygous mutations have been seen in many abnormal genes, the first being promoter of the MUCB gene, surfactant protein A and C, 
And most importantly and most commonly, telomerase reverse transcriptase gene. As you remember, telomeres are basically capped ends of a chromosome and prevent the chromosome from decaying and from cell from dying. And so if there's a mutation in this telomerase gene, there's telomere shortening that occurs, and this leads to apoptosis of alveolar epithelial cells. And of note, familial cases of IPF are really not distinguishable from sporadic cases. In fact, their high-res CT scan and lung biopsy specimens look exactly the same. The only difference will be there will be a family history in first degree of relatives of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and these individuals will be younger than your usual IPF individuals. So in summary, IPF is uncommon, but it's not rare. It's the commonest form of all idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. Pathogenic mechanism, as I described, involve a yet unknown trigger that causes this cascade of pro-fibrotic, pro-coagulant, pro-inflammatory pathway activation in the lung, and genetics of IPF are being invest investigated actively. And so if IPF were this lady, IPF would be saying, don't bother trying to figure me out. You'll just end up exhausting yourself. Moving on to the clinical course and prognostic factors of this illness. In a majority of patients, this is a disease of slow progression, meaning a majority of patients will slowly lose their force vital capacity of the lung over time, unless there are these lightning bolt events, which are called acute exacerbation of IPF, which is acute worsening of respiratory symptoms causing respiratory failure, which will cause a decline in their pulmonary function test rather quickly. There's also a minority of patients which will always be rapid progressors, meaning from the time of diagnosis to the time of death, their interval may be less than a year because of very rapid progression of this disease. These are the individuals which on lung biopsy specimens are likely to have more fibroblastic foci per high power field. And then also there's another minority of patients which will have a very stable, stable, stable course, meaning these patients may actually live on beyond the usual statistics of IPF. And really, we have no way of predicting which patient will fall along which trajectory. In fact, we don't even know if patients move from one area to another during the course of their disease. And how can we predict this? There is really no way of identifying that. So given all of this, what is the prognosis of IPF? You know, giving somebody a diagnosis of IPF is really a very serious problem. Why? Because you're pretty much saying their median survival from the time of diagnosis would be anywhere from 2.8 to 3.8 years. So indeed, it is a very serious diagnosis to give a patient. And also, once the patient gets sick enough to be either hospitalized or have respiratory failure requiring intubation and mechanical ventilation, their prognosis from an ICU admission is very, very poor. Very few of them will actually survive their hospital stay. And so what then are the factors that are associated with decreasing survival in IPF? The first would be the level of dyspnea as measured by different scales that are available when the patient first presents themselves, so that higher the level of shortness of breath, worse prognosis. Decrease in PFTs over time. So pulmonary function testing, we look for force vital capacity and diffusion capacity of the lung. We trend it over six months and any change in force vital capacity more than 10% drop or in the DLCO more than 15% drop is considered a poor prognostic sign. The presence of desaturation with walking or exercise or even at rest to less than 88% is also a poor prognostic factor. Higher fibrosis scores on a chest CT scan is associated with worse prognosis, and then the presence of the dreaded pulmonary hypertension is also a worse prognostic sign. And so although these sound very common sense factors to think of, worse the patient physiologically and symptomatically, worse the prognosis, it's actually nice to see that studies have actually proven what we think are poor prognostic factors. And so this study shows how you can separate out survivors from non-survivors, depending on whether they desaturate with exercise or not. And so that the non-desaturators here in pink have a better survival probability compared to desaturators here in blue. Same deal with pulmonary hypertension as it is 
defined by the presence of mean pulmonary artery pressure, more than 25, these patients actually have a much worse survival compared to patients who do not have pulmonary hypertension. And so in summary, the natural course of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is highly variable. Risk factors for prognosis have been well studied. The overall survival remains low. So moving on to treatment, and I'm going to divide this section into before and after because it was everything before October 2014 that was pretty much the game changer for IPF that we talked about. So treatment before October 2014 was basically full of all these clinical trials having studied all these chemicals of different pathways showing nothing but disappointing results. So you can see we have oral phosphodiesterase inhibitors, we have platelet-derived growth factor inhibitor, we have endothelin receptor antagonists, we have TNF-alpha blocking agent, anticoagulation, immunosuppression, all sorts of gamma and alpha and beta interferons, and all sorts of antioxidants. None of them seem to have made any difference to any parameters of pulmonary fibrosis, and this was hugely disappointing in the entire field of pulmonary fibrosis. And so pretty much the patients had no known medical therapies available for this disease, and the best thing we could do for them was refer for lung transplant. However, referring for lung transplant is not that easy, even though we have very well-defined criteria which give us guidelines of which patients with IPF should be referred for lung transplant. Again, very common sense findings. The diffusion capacity less than 40% predicted, decline in forced vital capacity on PFT testing more than 10% over six months, desaturation with walking, note that this keeps coming up again and again in every uh, arena of IPF, and the presence of pulmonary hypertension. These are the guidelines that are available for referral for lung transplant. But then what are we telling these patients when they're being transplanted? We're telling these patients that their survival after lung transplant at five years is about 50%, meaning for every 100 patients with IPF who will get transplanted today, five years later, only 50 of them will still be alive. So you're really basically exchanging one disease for another. You improve quality of life if the graph works really well. However, there's a lot of complications associated with lung transplant, so this is really not the best option for IPF patients. What are the other treatment considerations that we can offer to IPF patients? The best supportive care there is poor data about. However, everyone agrees that supplemental oxygen should be given to patients when they are hypoxemic. Pulmonary rehab programs are actually very, very helpful in maintaining conditioning. There are a lot of comorbidities that IPF patients have, including esophageal reflux, obstructive sleep apnea, and pulmonary hypertension, and their treatment is pursued. And eventually, if a patient is not a lung transplant candidate for whatever reason, palliative care referral is highly helpful. So in summary, in the absence of survival enhancing proven medical therapies, early referral for lung transplant has been traditionally encouraged. Also to remember comorbidities are very common in patients with IPF, and their diagnosis and treatment is to be pursued on a case-by-case -case basis. The way I look at treatments for IPF, especially with lung transplant, is this choice. I always offer two dinner choices, take it or leave it. So now moving on to the most exciting part of this talk, which is the new FDA-approved therapies for pulmonary fibrosis. The first I want to talk about is called perfenidone. Esbriet is the brand name. This became FDA approved in October 2014, so was a game changer for IPF. This is a very interesting compound. It's an orally active antifibrotic and anti-inflammatory agent. It inhibits the synthesis of transforming growth factor, which we all agree is a pro-fibrotic chemokine, and also inhibits the synthesis of tumor necrosis factor, or TNF-alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And so you can see it has multiple pleiotropic effects in the lung. It inhibits reactive oxygen species, so it has antioxidation activity. It also breaks down collagen, and this is really groundbreaking because we all thought fibrosis is an irreversible change in the lung. And so breakdown by using collagenase or matrix metalloproteinases is one of the mechanism of actions for this per perfenidone molecule. And so it inhibits collagen, inhibits TGF, inhibits TNF. And so what landmark study changed the dynamic for IPF? It's called the ASCEND trial that was published in the New England Journal. 
patients, about 555 patients, were given either the drug or the placebo. And you can see in panel A, the dec decrease in FVC over time was significantly less in the drug group. The change or the drop in FVC over time was significantly less in the drug group. The drop in six minute walk test distance was also significantly lower in the drug group, and hence they didn't drop their six minute walk distance quite as much. And there was an improvement in progression free survival in the drug group over the placebo. And so, in conclusion, there was a significantly reduced disease progression in the perfenidone group as measured by changes in forced vital capacity, six minute walk test distance, and progression free survival. So very encouraging findings. The second new therapy that the FDA approved in October 2014 was called Nintendanib. OFEV is the brand name. This is also a multiple tyrosine kinase inhibitor because it targets multiple growth factor receptors, some of them being platelet-derived growth factor receptor, fibroblast growth factor receptor, and vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. So pleiotropic effects, multiple pathways affected in the lung. The landmark trial that led to the approval of OFEV was called the IMPULSES trials. There was IMPULSES 1 and IMPULSES 2. And you can see about 1,000 patients were recruited for these studies and studied with use of drug versus placebo with the ad actual annual rate of change in the FVC being much, much lower in the drug group compared to placebo and the mean baseline change in dropping FVC much lesser in the drug group compared to placebo in both the different trials. The pool data pretty much summarized saying that there was a decrease in the annual forced vital capacity decline, although there was no change in the acute exacerbation rate and no change in death rate. So no survival advantage, but definitely slowing progression of the lung disease. And so in summary, two new FDA approved therapies have been in the market since October 2014, emerging after decades of negative clinical trials. It remains to be seen how these would affect long-term survival or the lung transplantation rates for patients with IPF, and referral for enrollment in ongoing extension trials is highly, highly encouraged. Having said that, I want to put a shameless plug for our Respiratory Institute clinical trials in IPF. We have four ongoing clinical trials at the moment. The first one is studying a connective tissue growth factor inhibitor. The second one is studying this chemical that I can't even pronounce. It's an anti-loxyl-2 agent. The third trial is looking at anti-IL-13 in IPF patients. And this fourth one that we're actually having a site visit for is combining those two agents that I told you about in IPF patients to study their effects. And actually, I'm going to be the PI of that trial. And so in wrapping up, I would like to acknowledge my ILD program team, without whom all of this is not possible. Dr. Padilla, my mentor, Aditi Matur, who is my sister in arms of the ILD program, Dr. Salvatore, who is our radiologist, Dr. Beasley, who is our pathologist, Yanis and Gina help us with our rheumatology and GI referrals, and Melissa, our nurse, who keeps us all in line. I want to thank Dr. D. Fabrizio, who was texting me all weekend long with like references from new journal articles, <laughs> which I haven't included any of them. <laughs> and, and a thank you to Dr. Powell for his guidance and support. Thank you. about this syndrome, which I'd like you to comment on, is that for a very long time, when the patient is ill, they are tachypneic, but they're not aware of shortness of breath. If you agree with that, could you try to explain that mechanism? I think the question was the patients can be tachypneic, but not perceive shortness of breath in some phases of the disease, whether I agree with it or if I can comment on that. Actually, the patients are very short of breath. Their dyspnea really actually sometimes precedes abnormal physiologic findings. 
And the dyspnea is thought to be related to the mechanoreceptors of the lung that are being hyperstimulated due to the early onset of collagen deposition. So the stiffness of the lung or the low compliance because of fibrosis will stimulate the mechanoreceptors and will cause shortness of breath or the sensation of dyspnea. Because by definition, dyspnea is just the sensation of breathing. We're usually not aware of our breathing, and when we do become aware, that is perceived by the brain as dyspnea. And so these patients are tachypneic, yes, because they have stiff lungs. Their minute ventilation can only be maintained by increasing the respiratory rate because their tidal volume is low from the stiffness. But I disagree in that they don't have dyspnea, they do have dyspnea. In fact, that sensation is quite prominent in these patients. And the other thing I would like to mention is the cough. To me, by far, the hardest thing to treat in these patients is their refractory cough. In fact, studies have done, been done to look and see whether steroids are helpful, whether thalidomide is helpful. This is why we need palliative care folks to help us out, because their cough is probably the most annoying symptom for patients with IPF. Other questions? Wow, you're all experts in IPF yeah. now. <laughs> Yes. Um, so what stage in the disease are you using these antifibrotic drugs? Because you know, we often get the criteria to use them when the patient has severe disease and it's almost too late at that point. It's a very good question. The question is at what stage of the disease would we be using these new antifibrotic agents that have been approved? And so the two trials, the landmark trials that led to the approval by the FDA, both of them had an inclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria for both of them in included a forced vital capacity between 50 to 90 percent. So now you can imagine they already excluded the real severe cases. All right, so anyone whose forced vital capacity is less than 50 percent were not included in these clinical trials. The other thing that was included in these clinical trials was the diffusion capacity, and that range was 30 to 90 percent. So this means that a diffusion capacity of up to 30 percent was inclusive in these trials. We, at this point, are pretty much using these antifibrotic agents in almost all comers as long as there are no contraindications to their use. These antifibrotic agents, I know they sound amazing, but they also have a lot of side effects and some very serious ones. So for example, almost everybody who takes these agents, whether it be perfenidone or nintendinib, all of them will have GI side effects, so nausea, diarrhea, anorexia, and weight loss is huge in these patients. The other thing with perfenidone is it's hepatotoxic, and so liver function has to be closely, closely monitored. The third thing with nintendinib was there is a high case of arterial thrombosis. So you can imagine you having patients that are older gentlemen who probably already have coronary artery disease and using nintendinib in those is fraught with danger. And so we have to make sure that there are no obvious contraindications, but are we using these agents for more severe cases, more severe than the ones that were studied in these studies? Yes, we are, but at the same time, we have to be cognizant of the harm that may be caused by their side effects. Um, we, the time that we are actually not using these would pretty much be an acute exacerbation of IPF because we really don't know what these antifibrotic agents will do in the setting of somebody who has acutely worsened. Will they do anything at all? Okay. Yes. Sachi, can you talk a little bit about choosing between the two new agents that we have and what, if any, are, I guess, absolute contraindications to either or both of them? Yes, another great question. So the question is that for both of these antifibrotic agents, what would make us choose one over the other and what are the contraindications? So more, we are more likely to use perfenidone over nintendinib in older individuals with any kind of vascular disease because nintendinib is the one that has been associated with higher incidence of arterial thrombosis. So the age of the patient and their comorbidities will determine the use of perfenidone over nintendinib. The second question was what are the contraindications? For perfenidone, it's definitely liver function abnormalities because it is quite hepatotoxic. Also, somebody who is thought to need any impending surgery or any kind of invasive procedure, perfenidone will be not preferred because wound healing, being that it's an antifibrotic, will be quite delayed. I'm actually very, very curious to see what happens when a patient is on perfenidone for a while and then goes in for a lung transplant? 
what will happen to, to their airway anastomosis if they have been on profenadone? Will there be any dehiscence? Because this is what happened with serolimus. When serolimus was used in the lung transplant population, there was a lot of airway dehiscence that was noted because of the antifibrotic effect. And so the absolute contraindication for perfenidone would be liver toxicity. The absolute contraindication for nintendinib would be any vascular disease, whether it be coronary or cerebrovascular or peripheral vascular disease. Any other questions? If not, I thank Dr. Gordon.